Professor of History and Philosophy of Science at the University of Cambridge. Professor Chang is an ideal scholar to present our annual Drake Lecture, which has been a feature of our annual meeting, meeting for 29 years. The Drake Lecture was named for the eminent historian of science, Stillman Drake, whose groundbreaking translations and analyses of Galileo's work changed the way we understand Galileo and his physics of motion. In the spirit of Drake, Professor Chang's work is an innovative integration of both historical and philosophical approaches to science, which our society sees ships values highly. Born in Korea, Chang and his family moved, emigrated to the US when he was young, and the intersection of science and the humanities inspired him from early on in his education. He received an honors BS in independent studies from Caltech in 1989, focusing on theoretical physics and philosophy. He went straight to a PhD degree at Stanford University, where he studied philosophy of science with John Dupre, completing a dissertation on the disunity of quantum physics in 1993. After a semester as a visiting graduate student at Harvard in the Department of the History of Science, Chang became a research associate in physics at Harvard. Following this, he taught years in the Department of Science and Technology Studies at University College London and ultimately moved to Clayton College at the University of Cambridge, where he has been since 2010. Chang is a pro prolific scholar in his over 60 articles and reviews, two books and two edited volumes. Chang addresses philosophical issues concerning measurement and realism, but often with a historical sensibility. His 2004 book, Inventing Temperature, The Measure of Scientific Progress, contextualized the challenges creating reliable measurements of temperature in the 18th and 19th centuries. His 2012 book is Water H2O, uses 18th and 19th century debates surrounding the identification or this particular identification of water in H2O to problematize something that we take for granted as a scientific fact. And the lesson is a call for pluralism in science. More recently, Chang has taken the question of how we might integrate history and philosophy of science head on and consistently challenges the status quo in these areas of scholarship. An innovator, Chang regularly collaborates across disciplines in his efforts to make history and philosophy of science relevant to the wider community of scientists, scholars, and educators. His talk today is entitled Pragmatist Philosophy for Historians of Science. Chief, please join me in warmly welcoming Hathok Chang. Thank you so much for that introduction, Mark. And I, I'm just positioning my keyboard here so I can advance this. Yeah, that would do. Yeah, it's a real pleasure and honor to be giving the Drake lecture. Um, I've never actually attended sea ships before, mm -hmm. although I was involved in what was used to be called the three society meetings, which some of you were. Remember, and 
I, I wasn't going to go into this bit of autobiography, but how I set it up for it, it, In some ways, I, I've always felt like I've lived on the fringes of Canada. <laughs> when I came to the US, which is when I was 16 years old, it wasn't actually my whole family who emigrated. It was just me who came to study. So I had an uncle uh, who looked after me. That uncle of mine lived in Plattsburgh, New York. Those of you who know where that is know that the nearest thing that you could call a city is Montreal. So that was what, what we did. We went to Montreal if we wanted some culture and nice food, whatever. And back in those days, I mean, I wasn't even a US citizen. Anyone could just go right past the border if they were in a US registered vehicle. <laughs> Those were the days. So, you know. And then, of course, um, I've drawn really strong inspiration from a whole range of Canadian HPS scholars, although none of them ever directly taught me. So the whole range from the late Ian Hacking to um, Alison Wiley and more recently, Sarah Misa. And um, Stillman Drake, I mean, I've never met the man, but when I got the invitation to give the Drake lecture, I was in the middle of teaching what we call a primary source seminar to undergraduates in our department. And I was teaching Galileo uh, dialogue, Drake translation, of course, so it was a particular pleasure to receive that invitation. So to the talk itself, the problem I want to start with today, I can advance this one. Oh, oh, uh, it's our, no, no, you should be quick on that. Yeah. So Let's see. The last yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, good. But the problem I started with is the text. Yeah. <laughs> the academic problem I want to start with today is the fact that history of science and philosophy of science have become quite distant from each other in recent decades. The various metaphors which you all know about. We say maybe some of these HPS departments are just marriages of convenience. Our um, mind often feel like that. And then we talk about the divorce. And this we feel keenly south of the border, right? Because the history of science society has divorced the philosophy of science association in terms of the joint co-located meetings we used to have every other year. And some say, well, we, Historians and philosophers are just alien tribes. Now, I'm curious as to how it is in sea ships. You have a good impression, but I had no impression. Mm -hmm. And I'm very sad about this situation because I've always got a great deal out of the history philosophy interaction, starting with being trained by Nancy Cartwright, Peter Gallison, John Dupre, Tim Lenoir, and all of these people at the same time. At Stanford, where I did my PhD, there was productive synergy of history and philosophy and seemed to be no strict demarcation between the two. But then on graduation, I discovered I couldn't get a job <laughs> in a philosophy department or in a history department. My career was only saved because Gerald Horton, who's still going, by the way, at age 101, um, yeah. Yeah. Because Horton gave me a postdoc in the physics department <laughs> at Harvard, and then I was saved by uh, what was then the HPS department at UCL in London, which became STS, and then Cambridge. Since then, I've devoted a great deal of effort in trying to do history and philosophy together. Now, in that relation, there are two directions of travel, of course, but I'm going to focus on just one today, namely how historians of science can and should relate to the philosophy of science, because I think that's the more concerning of the two directions at the moment. Many historians of science um, in the last decade, decades of the 20th century grew suspicious 
of what philosophers were doing with history and also what they were doing to history. In that story, no one has a more emblematic and poignant position than Thomas Kuhn. Even though he was the most prominent person who had used the history of science to change people's philosophical views, late in his career, he expressed some profound unease with what he called the historical philosophy of science. And much earlier in his career, he had already denounced certain types of historical work motivated by philosophical concerns, as is well known from his disputes with Imre Lakatos. So he's accused the Lakatosian historiography as philosophy fabricating examples. And I won't go through all this talk has a lot of slides, which I'm not going to use all of, but you have them in case anyone wants to hear about it in Q&A. So this is tricky, right? Kuhn had some genuine misgivings about the general idea of using history as evidence for philosophical theories. But I also don't think he ever really disowned the thought expressed in the opening sentence of Structure of Scientific Revolutions. Some of you may remember where he says how history could effect a decisive transformation in the image of science by which we are now possessed. As some of you in this room know, I had the incredible privilege of knowing Kuhn when I was a young student, and I tried to get some clarity on this subject without complete success. So um, this is because I randomly wrote him as a desperate undergraduate in physics and amazingly he replied that this was all long before email, right? <laughs> Old fashioned letters, phone calls, it was scary, but amazing. <laughs> this is a letter I got from Kuhn in 1994. Um, he was already quite ill with his cancer, but I was able to still visit him and so on. So in that letter, he talks about how the concerns and objectives with which philosophers and historians approach their shared database are radically different. And I, he thinks, deeply incompatible. And he says, historians learn about developments uh, uh, and mostly embody their results in narratives. Philosophers, to put the point too cheaply, learn about truth and the nature of knowledge. Trying to learn about both at once produces neither. And he refers to his old paper that's reprinted on uh, in uh, Essential Attention. And he says at the end of that paragraph, it's the same individual who does each, but not the same person. Wow. Okay. Now, at least Kuhn and many other historians at that time were thinking and worrying about philosophy of science and its relation to the history of science. But by now, it seems that the majority of historians of science have simply lost interest in philosophy. They have not found mainstream ideas and debates in the philosophy of science useful for the framing of their research questions or relevant to their research methods. Instead, historians of science have increasingly turned to social and cultural studies for their theoretical and methodological inspiration and resources. And some of us are trying to uh, revert this situation, as in this group for that for ourselves committee for integrated HPS, but it is an uphill battle. Now, there are various things I would say about the history philosophy relation, but the basic point I want to argue today is that historians of science can ill afford to disregard philosophy entirely. The two main reasons for this. And the first is that no history can be written without some kind of conceptual framing, right? So why exclude philosophical concepts and questions and only philosophical questions, concepts and questions in that framing? Why is it okay to use sociology, anthropology, economics, God knows what, but no, no, not philosophy. That's a little bit perverse. <laughs> The impulse for the exclusion of philosophy, of course, is only a reaction to some bad philosophy <laughs> that was seen to interfere with good history. So in the remainder of this talk, I'm going to be proposing, hopefully, a better philosophy of science that historians can safely and productively engage with. <laughs> 
if you think about science studies or STS generally, what is the common object of study in this multidisciplinary and disparate field? That's what you have here at, at your queue, right? How do we characterize this common object, science? Science studies is not something that can be properly done without thinking about the nature of science. But if you're thinking about the nature of science, you are deep in philosophy of science. Right? You may say that you don't need to know what science in general is. You're just dealing with what happens, uh, what happened to have, what happened to be called the sciences, and, and you just investigate particular happenings in those fields. But is it really insignificant that your subject matter is designated as science? even retrospectively. And people who say we solve the problem by talking about the sciences, I don't think so. <laughs> Just making something truer doesn't change the nature. And in case you want to insist that we should follow the science about vaccines, or you lament science denial about climate change or carcinogenic effects of tobacco or what have you, if you even want to go and shout your frustrations at events like March for Science, etc., it really is necessary for you to answer the question as to why scientific knowledge is worth trusting and trusting our lives with. And then you're up to your neck in philosophy of science. Secondly, Some of these key philosophical concepts are actors' categories in the history of science. Now, if you're a professional historian of science today, you probably internalize the notion that we should try to frame our analysis in terms of actors' categories whenever we plausibly can. That will prevent us from going into wiggish reconstructions and so on. Well, guess what? The actors' categories employed by past and present scientists include things like knowledge, truth, objectivity, evidence, reality, and so on. So these are the philosophical notions which many historians of science have developed an allergy to. But think again, right? These are not only important notions operative in scientific practices, but they are the aims that scientists and other promoters and practitioners of science often very consciously and expressively, expressly seek and defend. Talking about scientific practices while excluding all these key categories would be like an anthropologist refusing to discuss their subject's religious beliefs and cosmological worldviews or their intimate knowledge of their own surroundings and the investigative processes by which these people they study acquire and improve their knowledge. It would be perverse for anthropologists to disregard completely what their subjects care most about and identify as their main business. And it's equally perverse for historians to do the equivalent thing when they study past communities and individuals. So now let me switch gears a little bit. So this is why I think historians actually need philosophy. But even if you agree with all of that, if you're not trained in philosophy, you may feel that you don't really know how to take my suggestions on board. Because when you flip through a philosophy book or attend a philosophy talk, or even attend the philosophical session at sea ships, it's probably difficult to see how you can break into this alien mode of thinking, not to mention make productive use of it. Well, there's good news, which is I often feel that way myself. <laughs> That's why having done my PhD in philosophy, and so do many other professional philosophers. Some of us, many in this very room, have been working on crafting a kind of philosophy of science that will hopefully be useful and even indispensable for historians of science. So I've recently been able to make a synthesis of my own ideas in, in, in this direction in a new book uh, just published in October 
called Realism for Realistic People, a New Pragmatist Philosophy of Science. Now, I'm not going to try to present the detailed content of a whole book in 15 minutes, which is what I'm giving myself for this section. Um, makes me think of uh, once when I was at Harvard attending a seminar by Hilary Putnam and Peter Garrison. I have a vivid memory of Putnam sitting there with a big grin saying, any philosophy that can be put in a nutshell belongs there. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not going to do that. I'm showing you a nutshell. I'm not going to put it in there. What I am going to do is uh, pull out some suggestions that are particularly relevant to the doing of history of science, which I'll come to in just a minute. So it's my belief that what goes by the name of philosophy of science needs to step up to the challenge of providing useful thinking tools for science studies, including history of science. This is in the spirit of conceptual engineering, as some people like to call it these days. What I'm trying to do is make a philosophy of science that is fit for understanding and facilitating actual scientific practices, actual scientific knowledge, and actual scientific progress. If that works out well, then that will be a vindication of my ideas. So my pragmatist philosophy is also reflexively pragmatic about, <laughs> pragmatist, I should say, about the function of philosophy itself. So why should you be a pragmatist? Because you will find it useful. <laughs> Before I go on, let me briefly, very briefly, explain what I take pragmatism to be, because there are many ways of taking it and right from misunderstandings. So I just summarized it on that one slide. I take pragmatism as a philosophy of practice, which is focused on doings, what we do and how our thoughts function in the context of our actions. And experience in pragmatism, we take as something that active knowers undergo, not just a kind of passive information collection coming through the so-called five senses. And the point of knowledge is that it aids effective action. So I see pragmatism at its core as an empiricist philosophy, which states that the only ultimate source of any kind of learning is experience. But by experience here, we mean um, what Emerson right, uh, was very good about um, outlining. I, I take this from Sharon's book on the American pragmatist. Emerson said, we want empiricism, but not paltry empiricism. Experience, as, as James had it, would include everything out, out to the mystical, and you have to take in the insights of phenomenologists and everything else together for that sense of experience. And this includes the experience of making inquiries. So the justification of methods, even including logic according to Dewey, can only be empirical. So if that's what pragmatism is, why would it be useful for philosophy of science? That brings me to the three main pragmatist suggestions that I want to make to philosophers of science. The first is, uh, let's take knowledge primarily as an ability to do things, not merely the possession of information. So the typical analytic philosopher's way of understanding knowledge is propositional. Right? And epistemology okay. 101, you learn the justified true belief conception of knowledge. And then of course you learn how that's not quite right and you should slightly modify it to get to a better place. And I don't think we're gonna get to where we wanna get to in the understanding of practices, starting from that propositional knowledge. In the new book, I briefly mentioned this old Irish joke. It's a joke from Ireland, not about Irish people. <laughs> and it goes like this. It's a place called Letterfrack on the far west coast of Ireland, supposed to be very beautiful, it's remote, hard to get to. So the joke goes, the tourist asks a local person, how do I get to Letterfrack? Because it's got completely mixed up. 
And the local person says, okay, you can go over that hill and down the stream and over that pass and blah, blah, blah. Very long description. And then says, but I wouldn't start from here. <laughs> <laughs> so you could start from justified true belief and take all of those turns to approximate an account of practical knowledge. No, I, I wouldn't start from there. I would instead start with what I'm calling active knowledge, namely an ability to do something, make that our primary notion of knowledge, and understand how propositional knowledge functions within that. I'm invoking Ryle, I'm invoking Bitcoin, and Orbit. So that's the first suggestion. The second suggestion is let's use what I call epistemic activities and systems of practice as our units of analysis it follows directly from the first suggestion. And these are concepts uh, that I actually invented while uh, in the course of writing that book of mine called Is Water H2O? Because uh, I didn't want to just talk about theories. I wasn't quite happy with paradigms. I made up my own two-layer framework of analysis. And I'm channeling the spirit of Percy Bridgman, who once said, it is better because it takes us further to analyze into doings or happenings rather than into objects or entities. And in that empirical spirit, let's see how far that takes us. That's Bridgman at his high pressure pump, which was how he did his physics that won him the Nobel Prize extremely high pressure and oh yeah let's put everything under that see what happens those two proposals are hopefully quite uncontroversial although they go against the usual inclination of philosophers the third one is very controversial and let me take a little bit of time to spell out more carefully spell that one out more carefully. The proposal is let's understand the very notions of truth and reality as concepts based on the operational coherence of activities. So I call that. So there's a lot of new terminology I invented. And if you read the book, I hope you'll forgive me for making up all these new phrases. So the point is that I want to make the concept of truth and reality meaningful in actual practice. There are reasons why natural language is invented, terms like truth and reality. They're not just supposed to designate the completely inaccessible platonic heaven. No, uh, true and real means something in practice. And I believe that scientists, when they do science, understand these terms in the same kind of way that ordinary people deal with truth and reality in their lives. And you might say ordinary people don't care about truth. Uh, people used to often say that until, I'm now again thinking south of the border, until 2016. <laughs> Here's the New York Times saying, we give you truth, then we will give it to you at half price. <laughs> you need it. You need truth because otherwise you're going to go with Rudy Giuliani who says truth isn't truth. <laughs> I don't know what he meant by that. But, you know, complete disregard for our normal conceptions of truth, our norms for establishing what is true and what is not. That was what was being threatened with the emergence of Trumpism and so on. And suddenly lots of, I don't know, postmodern-ish liberal intellectuals realized, oh shit, we need truth. <laughs> but it's not the kind of truth that philosophers often tell, tell us about, the correspondence theory of truth. No, because we can't have that. And we have decades of philosophy just in the end saying, right, you, we can't have that. So here's Putnam again saying, to say that truth is correspondence to reality is not false, but empty. As long as nothing is said about what that correspondence is. So my proposal is this, 
So I make a notion that I call truth by operational coherence, which goes a statement is true to the extent that there are operationally coherent activities that can be performed by relying on what it says. This, I think, is the kind of idea of truth we have in the empirical sense. And a big footnote, which I won't go through, is that, of course, there are many different things that we actually mean by truth in English, right? And I don't mean all of those can be subsumed under my notion is in the blue, just one of them. And correspondence actually enters uh, in this thing that I call truth by comparison. But the second, if you want to com compare what the statement says, with what we regard as a fact, you have to first establish the fact, and at the end of that chain of justification come things like the ground is firm, as in Wittgenstein. These are matters of truth by operational coherence because we can live by them. Uh, it, it's like when James William James said, uh, "Something is true as long as you can write it, only in so far as you can write." It. Now, I have to say a word about this, this notion I keep using, operational coherence. What is that? It's not coherence in terms of the mutual consistency of propositions. It's, about, it's a way I try to think about the quality of our actions or activities. So about propositions, we can talk about truth. We can talk about consistency if we have a set of propositions, but if there's an activity we are engaged in, how do we think about the quality of how good that activity is? So roughly speaking, operational coherence is how things fit together in our activities. Do all the elements and aspects of that activity go together so that it's conducive to the successful achievement of the aim involved? So in the end, what I say is operational coherence is aim-oriented coordination. Have you designed your activity very carefully so that everything goes together? And you know, if you can, there are lots of different examples of coherence, but you can already see it in very simple activities like walking up the stairs or lighting a match, or you know, if there's a step along the floor and you, you ignore the sign that says mind the step and you go, that's incoherent, right? So starting with that, there are also very, very intricate systems like your GPS system that really has have, have to be fitted well, very well together. So I also deal with reality in this way. What is real? An entity is real to the extent that there are operationally coherent activities that can be performed by relying significantly on its existence and properties. So uh, again, I, I'm not going to give you full arguments for adopting these notions, but just trying to give you a flavor of the way I'm thinking in that recent book of mine and just to see how this kind of way of thinking can be applied to the doing of history. So no time to go through all of this, uh, these ideas. So I'm gonna talk for a few minutes in metaphor. So here's the Chilean philosopher, Roberto Toretti recently passed away. Uh, this is his critique of the so-called scientific realism. He says, the scientific realists believe that reality is well defined once and for all, independently of human action and human thought, yet in a way that can be adequately articulated in human discourse. This is just the kind of thing that historians of science have found completely useless. <laughs> so it continues that realists hold that science aims to develop just the sort of discourse which adequately articulates reality, which as Plato said, cuts nature is joined, and the modern science is visibly approaching the fulfillment of this aim. Now, the first thing I want to say is that the universe is not a chicken. Right? 
<laughs> Who came up with that? Plato or legend? Is that the way we should think about the cosmos? I don't think so. And then there's the, the other the point of control, the cave allegory, the idea that our direct experience of things is only illusions and the true philosopher can get out there, see the real nature of things. This is what Putnam is complaining about, right? Tell us how you do this. If you can tell me how to get out of the cave, I'll go with you. <laughs> Not likely. So this is a metaphor, visual metaphor that I'm proposing to replace all of that stuff. Now, this is not yet my metaphor. This is a metaphor that expresses the usual realist notion that uh, the world is like that building, all very sharply defined, and our representations are the imperfect copy of that reality, like the reflection on the water. Which is blurry, yeah, yeah, roughly the same, but not really. What I want to propose is that we invert this picture. Mm -hmm. This is the Nancy Cartwright move. No, actually, reality is messy. Reality is very dapper, as she says, messy, and it's our representations that clean that up. But that's not the end of the story, as far as I'm concerned, because what we have to recognize is that. Um, the blurry thing is reality as we experience it. It is not the platonic reality is blurry. Sometimes I wonder if Nancy Cartwright thinks that real reality is that we have to talk about them. But I think what, how we understand this is that reality as we experience it is blurry and our representational practices clean it up. But there's one more step, which is that uh, how we experience reality is going to be affected by how we conceptualize it. Because everything is theory laden in representation, and even experience is a representation. So it's got to be a, a, a never ending iterative process in which conceptions gradually evolve by engaging with our experience. So that's uh, the kind of thing I, I put on the cover of the new book. Oh, yes. That's Norway and Moscow would be in that case out there. <laughs> okay, so uh, um, let me just stop uh, there with the presentation of this uh, fragment. Is there a well, no, no, no. How do I get rid of that? So you want to stop, stop sharing? Oh, that's screen? okay, yeah. I, I just don't want other stuff to, yeah, don't stop sharing. Oh, okay. I just don't want a bar. Yeah. Oh, I see. Is it yeah. not? It's gone. Okay. Yeah. So Maybe it was never there. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, having presented some very broad philosophical ideas, what I'd like to do now is illustrate how these ideas can be employed in historical work because that's what I promised. And I'm going to do it through one extended example, which is uh, my current historical project on the history of batteries and what I call battery science in the long 19th century. Now, yeah. just having trouble advancing again. I am going to talk about progress later. <laughs> right, okay, right. So for battery science in the 19th century. If you know anything about this history at all, you probably know about the sensation that was caused by the invention of the voltage pipe in 1800 and its productive employment. It started with just enlightened entertainment, but soon included scientific uses like electrolysis in chemistry and important practical uses, for example, powering the global telegraph network. Every little telegraph station had to have a battery to run the thing. We don't think about that. 
And without batteries, there would have been no electric circuit, without which there would have been no discovery of the electromagnetic effect, without which there would have been no electric motors or generators, without which there would have been no, elect no electrical power grid. And we couldn't do any of the things that we take for granted when we plug our devices, including rechargeable batteries, into the outlet in the wall. And imagine trying to do any scientific research today without an electricity supply. So I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that there would have been no scientific and technological civilization as we know it without the invention of that tank and all that followed from it. So it's a crucially important subject that has somehow not received sufficient attention from historians and science, even technology. There are some exceptions. A recent book by Jay Turner for Charged. Uh, I haven't gone through it yet, but it looks good. And some decades ago, there was a book called Bottled Energy by Richard Schallenberg, who died young, unfortunately. Anyway, there's not very much, but I'm trying to provide a basic history. Now, if you know a little bit more about the history of batteries, you probably also know about the long-lasting dispute about how it is that batteries work. So, you know, what, what had Borta done? It's very, very simple what he had done. <coughs> I just closed that. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. Hopefully, it didn't go. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, what did Borta do? He, he put a piece of silver down on the table, then a piece of zinc, and then a wet piece of paper soaked in salt water on top, <coughs> And repeat. That's it, right? And people could make this even from reading a newspaper article reporting on this experiment. So it's like the opposite of the experimenter's regress, right? I mean, no need for tacit knowledge here to make this thing, but it was extremely hard to agree on how this generated all these different effects. So what Vorta had done was made that pile and he then touched the far end with his own fingers and got himself a shot. You can do this. I've done this many times. <laughs> very, very easy to do at home. But why does the piling up of these pieces of metal and something wet produce this flow of electricity? And there was this contention, right? between two opposing theories. The so-called contact theory was Borta's own idea. He thought that this, this contact between two different metals excited a flow of the electrical fluid in one direction. Why do you have the wet stuff? Well, so you can conduct it to the next step. Because if you don't have the intervening layer, you get a symmetric situation, nothing can happen. The so-called chemical theory said, no, 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 it's nothing to do with the metallic contact. It's the chemical reaction between one of the metals and the wet stuff. So in this case, the zinc and the salt water. Why you have the other metal to convert that electricity. And they fought and fought for almost a century, actually a little bit beyond the century. So this dispute has provided the most common way in which the early history of batteries has been framed by historians of science. And here's one example that I actually really admire, the Danish uh, historian of physics, Henrik Kral, um, who tells us that actually, right, this whole pay controversy was so long and complex, and it went throughout the 19th century, and he says it came back in the 20th century and still there was no consensus. So what happened with this? Well, I mean, the leading scientists just got tired of it. <laughs> and who cares how batteries work when you're dealing with relativity and quantum mechanics? And like, as long as the stupid batteries work, that was fine. Uh, so it kind of is a doubt. So that, that's all true what Krauss says, but there are still some serious limitations about this way of framing the history. So there's too much focus on the winning and the losing and not enough, enough attention to the genuine achievements of both sides. 
and seeing only two sides opposing each other, neglects the other people who are doing other things. And then treating the theoretical debates and the technological development, developments quite separately, uh, we lose a lot. And then having made that separation, the, the standard historiography then just focuses on the theory, leaving the devices to the historians of technology. You don't hear about that unless you go and attend shots. So there are these shortcomings. Uh, to remedy them, I reframe the history by making full use of the pragmatist suggestions that I have presented to you. So instead of competing theories, I identify systems of practice, as promised, and as many as four systems, which all developed in parallel and in interaction with each other. The systems of practice incorporate not only theories and concepts, but experiments, instruments, and technological developments. They include various kinds of activities with various aims, more or less coherent in each in itself and in relation to each other and broader aims. So I trace the development of active knowledge achieved in these systems, tracking the truths learned and realities identified and created within each system. And I also know how the different systems interacted productively with one another, in large part because they had to, because there were certain problems that could not be solved effectively in any of these four systems. So what I'm gonna to try to do now is give you some very brief highlights uh, from this work, just so you can get a flavor of it. It's gonna be a very small nutshell for uh, manuscript that's already too long and I have to, yeah, you know that problem. Yeah. If you've written history books, you know how that goes. So here are the four systems of practice uh, that I've identified. In the forthcoming book, which is called How Does a Battery Work? Um, there's a chapter on each of these systems. And I'm going to spend a few minutes describing the first one because that's that's the one that's supposed to be just wrong. <laughs> it's it's like how I dealt with Phlogiston and Hilaric. I like these wrong things mm -hmm. and showing how they were not really all that wrong. So I'm mean, going to spend a few minutes describing the first system and very quickly tell you what the other is on. So the, the so what I'm calling the contact electrostatic system stems from Volta's own view on the mechanism of his battery, which, as I mentioned, was I mean the title of his original paper expresses it very well: on the electricity excited by the mere contact of conducting substances of different kinds. That's it, you don't need to read the paper. <laughs> Just knowledge. And he had done this curious experiment, putting two pieces of different metals together and separating them, he realized they had become charged. Plus and minus. Zinc and silver makes the uh, zinc plus positive and silver minus. And in fact, this is why he invented the pile in the first place, because he wanted to multiply this effect to, to show easily to people. So how do you multiply something? Pile them up. And the really interesting thing about the history is that this notion, right, that when you put two different metals together, electricity goes one way rather than the other, is really long lasting. Now, if you ask an electrochemist today, they'll say, yeah, that's just, I mean, they've never even heard of it, mostly. If they had, they think that was just a mistake, mistaken idea, which was overridden by the development of physical chemistry. Oswald had a very triumphalist account of all of this. When you look at the history more carefully, you realize, no, there are really interesting developments that happened, including all these other instruments that really exhibit this idea of contact tension. So the first thing that comes up was the so-called dry pile, which is like the voltaic pile, except the wet layers are not wet. They're dry, and the argument is there can be no chemistry happening if you do that. 
So Oxford University Physics Department still has one of those on display. Apparently been running for a hundred years. Um, what's even more amazing was the thermocouple, which now is used as a differential thermometer mostly, but the idea is you put two wires made of different metals together, two junctions, put two junctions at different temperatures and boom, current flows. There is a voltage happening when the two junctions of the two same pairs of metals are put on the different temperatures. That's interesting. And, and the, this is not chemical. Right? So how did the chemical theorists make sense of this? They mostly ignored it. An amazing moment for the thermocouple was that the thermocouple was the battery used by Georg Ohm in the experiment that gave us Ohm's law, because the wet cells were just too unstable. And uh, this is a very interesting story. And with, with Ohm's law, electrical science goes in a completely different and more effective course of development. And then there's a story about William Thompson making a very sensitive instrument to measure these effects. And then in the 20th century, this is crazy. The idea of voltaic contact potential gets picked up by various physicists who really build amazing and important experiments on the basis of that idea. So here's the photoelectric effect. It all boils down in the 20th century to the idea that different metals have different work functions or Fermi levels. Right? If an electron wants to liberate itself from a metallic right. surface, the amount of energy that that requires depends on the kind of metal it's trying to escape from. So if you put two different metals together, electrons, yes, we would like to go in that direction rather than the opposite. And that was even the way that transistors were initially conceptualized. <clears throat> and the experimental work is still going on. I picked up this paper of 2016. So there's this robust system of practice, which has been certainly ignored by most of the electrochemists now that digging into the history reveals to us. Now, as promised, I'll be more brief about the other ones. The second one, which I call the chemical imbalance system of battery science, that's more like the orthodoxy in electrochemistry today. If you ask today's chemist, how does a battery work? Almost always you get that picture, the Daniel cell, which has a pair of redox reactions each metal dipped in its own solution, as it were, and they have different electrode potentials. And the difference between the two electrode potentials give you uh, the cell voltage. So it's the idea that two chemical reactions are competing with each other, and there's an imbalance, and electricity goes around. And there's a very interesting story I could tell if you're interested about how, I mean, what this is what we call the Daniel cell. There was an actually actual person called Daniel with that weird spelling of his last name, John Frederick, first professor of chemistry at King's College London. Anyway, he invented this as a purely practical device. And it's only later that people then learn to read the conceptual thing that I just told you about. So there are very interesting um, stories about that. And, that's Daniel's original diagram, and you can see uh, you may be able to read ox gullet here. It was using the esophagus of an ox to separate the electrolyte into two parts. That's the origin of the two compartment um, configuration, but he was only doing it thinking, I need to block this old zinc from coming over to the copper side. He wasn't reasoning theoretically about it. Anyway. So lots of interesting stories about that. The third system, which I call the conservationist, is all about energy and its conservation. Right? So it is seeing the battery as a device that converts one kind of energy into another. And what's shown here is, is one of the earliest reversible batteries. The iconic um, apparatus of the system is your rechargeable battery. First practical one of which was the lead acid one 
that we've still had in the mind, but some of the cheaper kinds. And then what I call the vascular mechanical system is thinking about the molecules and atoms and ions and how does this all work out in terms of particles and their interactions and, um, and lots of intriguing things that happen, but it also includes this basic theory of chemical, fundamental theory of chemical combination developed by Berzelius and David with this idea that atoms are electrically charged. So no time to tell you much more, but uh, that's a picture from Hittorf who was really trying to get at the speed of ions in an electrolytic situation, very intricate. Music. So let me stop now with the illustration um, of the details of battery science. I hope you, you have got enough of a sense as to how the history framed in that sort of pragmatist conceptions looks really quite different. So there are two things I want to do before I uh, finish. One is to briefly tell you some methodological thoughts about the history I just sketched. One is that you see pluralism in action. Right? On the one hand, the four systems developing in parallel, but not only that, you also see this interactiveness between the different kinds of systems. And I can tell you about how I think the question, the original question of how the voltaic cell works can only be answered adequately by making a little local ad hoc synthesis of two of the four systems. I can tell you more about that if you'd like to hear. Two more points. Uh, what I'm offering here is really quite an internalist kind of history, but the pragmatist framing, I think, really allows very easily links to broader context because we are talking about people's aims and their activities and what I'm calling active knowledge. And finally, the interaction between history and philosophy. Um, these ideas are not only illustrations of, I mean, the, the, the historical accounts I've given you, are not only illustrations of my philosophical ideas, but they were forged in doing the history. Everything I was telling you about was meant to be just in one book until it just got out of hand and I had to separate them. But they're like Siamese twins or whatever we call them nowadays. Um, so let me uh, end with some closing thoughts. Am I okay for a few minutes? Yeah. So stepping back from the specific his history of battery science, I would like to close with Two general thoughts. First, uh, pragmatist philosophy of science allows us to move away from certain unrealistic and unproductive images of science and scientific knowledge that are endemic in philosophers and many scientists' views of science, which today's historians of science are going to find unsavory, even offensive, or at least tiresome. The removal of such views from the philosophy of science can only help in bringing philosophy and history closer together again. Instead of the monism and arrogance that underlie the standard so-called scientific realist view that science approaches the absolute truth, we can have an abundant picture of knowledge growing in multiple directions in response to multiple types of aims in multiple types of situations. This, I believe, is a kind of picture of knowledge that today's historians can happily work with. Now, one key place, uh, this is the second thought, one key place where such removal of unhelpful philosophical doctrine is urgently needed is on the topic of scientific progress. Scientific progress is nowadays something that's really shunned as a topic by most professional historians of science. And I think there's a great irony in that situation. Why? Because many scholars who are very skeptical about the notion of scientific progress also happen to be the most ardent advocates of social and political progress. 
If you don't think progress is meaningful or possible, even in natural science, then I say good luck with your progressive politics. It's not that we should not ask critical and probing questions about the ideal and the reality of scientific progress. Rather, the problem is not thinking about it at all, which only has the effect of allowing widespread unhelpful notions of it to dominate our society. Progressivism is one of the most distinct characteristics of science as we know it, and therefore not something we can disregard when we try to understand science. It is at the core of scientific realism as I conceive it, which is all about learning and learning and learning more about reality. From Bacon to Conant, from Comte to Curie, from those who sought to measure the shape of the earth to those who try to make images of black holes, the whole scientific enterprise has been driven by the desire for more and better knowledge. Historians of science must understand and engage with this core aspect of science. And considerations of context and values can and must enter into this engagement. More generally, we need history that is fully informed by philosophical thinking about the nature of scientific practice and scientific knowledge, and at the same time, fully engaged with social and ethical concerns. So what I hope to present to you, uh, to have presented to you in this lecture today is not a declaration of a position, it's not even really arguments toward a position, but it's an invitation an invitation to historians of science to use something like the philosophical framework that I presented today, and an invitation to philosophers of science to join me in developing this and other related frameworks further. That way, together, we can make philosophy of science useful again for historians and others, and get on with the task of putting it to good use. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much. Um, yes. So I'm I'm very sympathetic to what you're doing, but for me, uh, some of it doesn't seem so new because it sounds a lot like feminist pragmatism. Yeah. Right. So there's a lot of feminist philosophy of science, the pluralism, the um, the uh, knowledge is active. Um, the, the call to values that you had at the end, uh, a kind of critically pro-science kind of attitude where you need to be critical. Uh, and, and I think that quite a few historians are actually pretty informed about that stuff and use a kind of feminist philosophy of science, kind of Sandra Harding or Alison Wiley. Uh, that stuff is, is informing them in part because the role of power, um, the uh, embeddedness in a social context, uh, and also revisionary projects of the history of science, which of course is work for historians to do, um, all kind of fit with that. So I was just hoping you could uh, just tell me either, yeah, you're right, or, <laughs> that's or tell me how your project is distinct from feminist pragmatism and whether I might be right that there's already a, a fair engagement of historians with that literature. So, yeah, thank you. Three quick things. One, yeah, you're right. Uh, two, a lot of people you describe, they just don't call it philosophy of science. But it is, right? I mean, yes, feminist philosophy of science uh, is a recognized category, but I, I think, so this is a third thing. I think it, it's not limited to feminism where these kinds of insights are in play. I mean, a lot of sociology of science, anthropology of science, I, I think they do bring in these philosophical insights, but they don't call it philosophy. Um, I think partly because what philosophers tend to call philosophy is really very disconnected. So we, I think that the picture I have is meeting halfway by right 
changing what's mainstream philosophy, uh, where it is extremely surprising that pragmatism doesn't get a look in at all in our um, standard philosophical education. Uh, so that's got a change. And then um, others who have been working in the way you describe can also engage more with this reformed kind of philosophy of science. That is my So, I mean, wh whether anything I'm saying is new in a really genuinely different way, um, I'd be happy in a way if nothing or none of this is new. I mean, if it's just obvious to most people, I'd be very happy, but I don't think it is. I agree with everything you said. <laughs> um, surprisingly, uh, unsurprisingly, um, and perhaps um, I just want to add uh, that we should be asking for reunion, not just um, with history of science and philosophy of science in a pragmatist way, but also a reunion of science and philosophy of science. Yeah. And if you look at some recent work. Uh, from scientists, like I've seen this Jimmy Peebles book, The Whole Truth. Uh, he argues that scientists are pragmatists in philosophy, in their mm. philosophy of science. Uh, you know, lots of people in medicine, Trish Green, uh, and others, think that pragmatism is the method of, of medical science. And uh, actually, when Peebles, um, uh, the first draft of Peebles' book, uh, he's obviously a physicist, but the first draft of his book was a chemistry example. So. Mm -hmm. And then when it was published, I think some reader must have said, you have a Nobel Prize in physics, you should be writing about physics. <laughs> and it, it's another example is physics, but the first draft, it was all, you know, chemistry uh, really abides by pragmatist philosophy of science, the kind of notion of truth that you've articulated. Yeah, yeah so thank you. Um... I mean, in a straightforward way, most scientists are practical people. Right? They want to make things work. But I think uh, many scientists have, a, I don't want to call it a split personality, but something approaching that. Because in their practice, when they're in the lab or doing their computations, they'll be very pragmatic. And then when, they feel like they should say something important about the nature of science. They, they just pay lip service to that unificationist, reductionist uh, project that they don't themselves really practice. And I think it's, it's like an ideology that, that many philosophers of science and scientists share, right? So that, that's the part of it that I'd like to get at. I think in, in their daily practice, yeah, they are, if anything, just true practice. Thank you, Oscar. Uh, Oscar was just telling me before the talk that you know, get ready to be converted to pragmatism. So I have one question before my conversion. <laughs> um, with a little bit analysis of truth in terms of this notion of operational coherence and also whether uh, entity is real uh, in terms of that. So something that kind of motivates realists, uh, especially those who have like a propositionalist kinds of epistemology is that knowledge, at least quantum knowledge had to do some kind of representation. Right? Mm -hmm. That's why proposition is a nice thing to, yeah. to sort of pick up and it has a nice relation to truth. Uh, so and just the correspondence on all of that. Um, and this maps on to kind of also some understanding, some scientific practice, which a lot of it aims at representation. Mm -hmm. um, this is not to deny that operations play kind of uh, skills and a bit of an important role in it, but it seems that representation seemed to be at least a goal, if not the end goal, right? Um, proper epistemic goal in its own right. So I was wondering whether one to kind of analyze truth just in terms of the operational mm -hmm. coherence you also miss out on the representational element that seems to be important because uh -huh. it seems to 
not that sort of truth implies or it's analyzed in terms of operational coherence, but operational coherence entails that there is some kind of representation that you're dealing with in, in some sense. So, so think about kind of the uh, yeah, let, let me try and answer uh, and you can tell right. me if I got the sense of your question. I do think that scientific practice is full of representations, but it's not the representation of the nominal form. If we just borrow the Kantian idiom for a moment, representations that we do actually make represent one phenomenal thing with another. Both are accessible. If I look at something and paint a picture of it, I can check the correspondence. This is the kind of thing we do all the time. And that's not the same thing as what Putnam is despairing about concerning the correspondence theory of truth, right? So, I mean, even something like your you know, ball and stick model of molecules, they're not really representing molecules, they're representing our ideas about how molecules are made. That's the correspondence that we can check, right? So there, there's this easy slippage into thinking, oh, they must really represent molecules. The platonic heaven molecules. No, I, I don't think that's what we're doing with representations in actual scientific practice. Does that imply, in terms of kind of the reality of entity stuff that you're talking about, does that imply that there is no such entity that you're representing? No, no, the next step is, Right, what are molecules? Are they real or not? And according to my conception, they are real if you can deploy them to do various coherent things, right? And that thing, yes, you can represent that theoretically, but that's a different kind of correspondence between, uh, from the correspondence between the theoretical conception and the Material model, right? So there are representations going in all kinds of directions. Just none of it goes to platonic heaven. <laughs> Um, yeah, pass on. Thanks. I mean, I'm a philosopher dating a historian, so I appreciate all the free relationship advice. I'm not going to echo the, the feminist comment earlier, but I'll, I'll change to something else. Um, I was I was surprised, like as a pragmatist, which I think of myself as, that at the end you went to progress, mm -hmm. and, and you said, and and I didn't, I, I thought you were attributing this to your own view. The whole scientific enterprise has been driven by the search for more and better knowledge. Mm -hmm. And as a pragmatist, I just find that to be like, like wrong, both empirically and for the kind of philosophy that I'd like to be interpreting scientific practice. That scientific practice is often driven at much more local, pragmatic ends. And to be thinking about progress in those terms of just more and better knowledge is kind of, I was surprised to even fit within the kind of contextual think, view that you were giving earlier yeah, in, yeah, yeah. in the talk. But I think that's because you, you have this old idea of what knowledge is. There's knowledge in everything we do, right? And this is the Dewey point of view. Life is just full of the processes of inquiry, right? So if I, <coughs> that the, the continuity of methods is talking about, for example, from road building to logic, all the way that there's no sharp divide there. So if I'm learning to find my way around on this quite confusing to me canvas, <laughs> <laughs> that's a search for better knowledge. <laughs> so, yeah. but, but why isn't it also the search for this lecture? Well, it is, but there is knowledge of where this lecture hall is, how it fits in with the other places that I need to get to, right? So I, I don't see the contradiction in that, right? I mean, why wouldn't you say that there is knowledge in every kind of activity that we carry out, however mundane and however local and however contingent? Well, I, I thought it was a claim about what is driving science, motivational. Yeah, and it's driven by because the desire for better and more knowledge at every level. Yeah, I mean, I guess, right. I, I mean, maybe it's an empirical description, but like my 
my desire to figure out where this room was yeah. is not a desire for knowledge. It was a desire to see your excellent talk. Which one? <laughs> desire for knowledge, maybe in the end. <laughs> <laughs> it's all knowledge just makes the makes the progress thesis true. It's like let's just there's knowledge in everything that we do, every piece of experiment, every piece of every time I go to the store is a search for knowledge. Good. Okay. And not all of it, right? Hopefully, finding the story is true, but finding cosmological constant isn't. Finding the cause of all kinds of mental illnesses is not trivial, but I mean, there's just no sharp divide between the trivial stuff and the grand stuff. And I think science is driven by both the trivial and the grand and in between. Uh, thank you, and, and um, I have questions that would go from you. Know, uh, so, speaking as a historian of science, thinking about Greg Braddock's explorations mm -hmm. of uh, counterfactuals, we could talk about uh, the lady and Hacking's work into historical epistemology. But I, I want to rather redirect to thinking about disciplinary structures and career pathways and things like that. So, I'm going to read two. Thesis uh, to 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 quote the current history of science is almost always readable, engaging, and instructive, even but curiously inert, finely wrought but flat. The price of disciplinarity has been a convergence toward the mean: fewer clunkers, but also fewer meteors. Lorraine Daston, Critical Inquiry, two thousand nine. Well, why was that? Well, it's because until recently, individual career paths into the history of science. Were usually sinuous rather than straight, and the field was a haven for people from every corner of the academic map, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Okay, part of that stuff, 2009. Coming out this month, Steve Shapin, London Review of Books. The structure of scientific revolutions was the work of an amateur. <laughs> the path from structure to last writing has its own story to tell. One is about the ambition and edginess of an individual author, brilliant, original, prickly, passionate. Another would be about the power of the disciplines as they can increasingly control academic life and to disengage from the public sphere. So perhaps the story here is not one about historians uh, counter working with philosophers or other things, but increasingly becoming self enclosed in their own little bubbles. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, Right. I, I think it is called as as you was wondering. Um, but I think that is true. Yeah, that history of science has become more professionalized and more self-enclosed, and so has philosophy. Right. Um, there, there are vast stretches of philosophy of science for which are incomprehensible to even other philosophers. <laughs> so that is a general problem, I think. But I don't know. I I'm not gonna say this about history, but at least about philosophy, I think if philosophy becomes completely like no more science, that is the death of philosophy. Yeah. I think philosophy is especially um, not suited for just being the person solving yeah. activity because it is the mission of philosophy to raise questions that other people are not raising. Yeah, I, I agree with yeah. what so, that I think is, is wonderful, but there's also these social causes yeah. about the career path. So how do it we, could be a Darwinian explanation that there were lots of sci uh, historians that were interested yeah. in philosophical cases and being their jobs. Right. And I mean, uh, let me just mention one other thing because this, I think, is important, right? I mean, how did history of science get on in the disciplinary landscape in the last several decades? We became more and more embedded in general history departments. Yeah. We, we looked more and more to the standards and demands of the history profession. And do they do they love us back? <laughs> this is how, for example, history of chemistry died in the UK. It doesn't die, but in the UK, all the great people were not replaced by 
historians of chemistry, not even historians of science. A couple of exceptions, like Matthew Eddy succeeding David Knight, but yeah. that's an exception, right? So has this paid off this kind of disciplinary um, alignment? So I think probably time to go back to the drawing board. Yeah, I agree. Gordon. Yeah. Um, well, in Canada, uh, historians and philosophers uh, get along a little better than other places. And it, in part, it's our history of uh, departments that were set up as joint Mm -hmm. things and also we have a tendency in English Canada and set at Western um, uh, of uh, uh, historical ontology questions and you find that in in Quebec and the French tradition as well right yeah uh, uh, so there is a you know this interaction that's a little thicker than uh, what you might worry about in the ang the complete Anglo and American tradition right but you're offering Pragmatism? It's, a, it's the most boring uh, uh, philosophy this side of the papers. Uh, I mean, Ian Hacking wrote a wonderful uh, uh, paper called uh, Why? On Not Being a Pragmatist. And he starts with that great joke, uh, which I remember. Uh, of course, pragmatism is true. The trouble is that it doesn't work. <laughs> but, but what he's saying is that that's very interesting to say as some kind of initial encounter. Yes, we'll look at the practices and and, uh, and follow them around and to maybe think of them as operational. But then there's a much more interesting thing go, going on in philosophy. Um, even your cases there could be subsumed under William Huell's notion of Consilience of inductions, right? So we believe something is a natural kind because many practices that are irreducible one to the next say something to each other. But that's not pragmatism. No. Uh, 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 that's not operationalism. That's something much more interesting that that historians might be interested in. You know, we re if we read William James, some historians would say. James is making a claim about a radical change that happens in late modernity towards in, uh, indeterminism, right? The lack of, uh, of cause being the ground of everything. And it says something about quantum mechanics. If you're writing the history of quantum mechanics, and it's not just a ser series of social interactions of those that are hanging around in, uh, in quantum mechanics, but something really interesting philosophically. So, uh, you know, sidelining us to an American pragmatism that uh, says we'll reduce everything down to operationalism uh, misses really cool stuff that's happening in philosophy that uh, historians are not so adverse to encountering. Well, I, my yes. sense is that you are, for example, would be improved by attention to activities when you're talking about consilience of inductions. What are we doing when we make Consilient inductions, and he doesn't tell you that much about it, right? Well, I don't think about it mineralogy and how they measured the uh, the angles, and then there was the chemical uh, thing on mineralogy. It tells us a lot about. It. I'm not an advocate of fuel, but I'm just saying that there's something more going on than than just uh, an operational account of science, of which would just be jumping out of the social turn into another social term or another um, I don't see that so. hmm. I mean I have this another social term. we have a little correction yeah. red bonds here of course Ian Hacking was a pragmatist so I asked him he to write actually that said paper. he was not a pragmatist I know I asked him to write that paper it's in a volume uh, I edited and we've been talking about how he was a pragmatist but as, as everyone who knows the end of this room knows he did not want to be labeled as any kind of philosopher, but of course, he's a pragmatist or not. I mean, hacking aside, um, well, what I'm advocating is not a reductionist recipe, it's an orientation, right? My inspiration, as I briefly mentioned, is as much Bridgman as Peirce, right? Let's analyze things into doings and see how we get. Now, if the answer, having tried it, is it's pretty boring, then that's what it is, right? <laughs> but I wouldn't prejudge it until we've done the analysis. Okay. Um, well, I sort of, um, so I'm reminded of, I was reading, 
Johnson was larger, and he's responding to critics like Kuehl, who say, well, look, you come up with these laws of thought, and they're like, they're really schematic. And, and the whole problem of science is actually getting things into a mode where you could actually say, oh, okay, well, we eliminate this, and it doesn't happen, or like, the, the very, the five laws of thought. Um, um, or inference. Um, and Mill says, yeah, that's true, but that's that's the whole point. It took, I have to, I have to extract the, the only thing that's common to all of science is these inferences. And indeed, most of the almost all of science isn't these inferences. I would never say that. And um, so it's it's um it seems like that there are two impulses, you know, trying to understand science. One is to one is to try and extract some some uh clarified essence from it and one is to engage with its its um rich and very textured actual practice and um it seems like there's th things you can do in one mode and not the other i mean i think you could complexify like Something like Kuhn's take seems too simplistic to say, well, there's only two, they're like different, completely different modes that I just don't talk about. It's probably, but maybe there's some, there's a, uh, uh, anyway, a recurring theme that there are different questions being asked by different practitioners, uh -huh. and that they, that some of the disagreement isn't isn't really the kind of disagreement you can worry about. It's disagreement about you should try to do different things. Of course, you don't disagree. But um, the question is to how to understand how to best um, productively work uh, within the yeah. I, I, in general, the my general strategy, even when it comes to logic, I would think is to ask right what are these people aiming at what is the kind of activity they're engaging in in order to get there what exactly is this activity or rather i mean i end up with systems which have lots of different activities in it right so that, that's the way to break it down and then you realize Right, there, there are different types of activities going on which aim at very different kinds of aims. Sometimes they're nested within each other. Sometimes there is a hierarchy of activities. All of that is contingent, right? So you look at each situation and there's a way to get at it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so this just felt like a very sort of intellectually interesting marriage counseling session to me. Um, <laughs> part of my story of science married to a philosopher of science. So it's, right. it's very interesting. And I'm not talking about my partner when I say this. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so but if, it's, if it is a bit of a, a marriage counseling session, you know, as a historian, one of the things that I might want to say is that like one of the things that my philosopher spouse does, if not my real one, is they use history in this way that works me, right? Mm -hmm. Like they take little like vignettes or little case studies and they're kind of like toy examples and then they you know spout from from those and so my question from this um is could you say more about the conception like the philosophical conception of history that is that goes along with the view that you're proponing here um because you know the historians you know we were all vexed about what is history and yeah. contingency and complexity and all that sort of stuff and so yeah how how do we think about history yeah in your view? Yeah. Uh, I don't want to get into this whole thing that I have about uh, how presentism is really important. Uh -huh. oh, you, uh -oh. I'm happy. I'm happy yeah. with the presentist, but yeah. So let, let, me, let me stick to history of science okay. because uh, I, I don't know if I can comment intelligently at this hour about general history. So in my own peculiar conception, the whole point of history is not only to understand how we got here, but to learn from the past. And I mean it in an actual content-specific scientific way. 
So it is to take the past of science really with great respect, like right? to see. This is kind of an anthropologist view. Right? Here is a group of people who lived this intellectual life in a very coherent way for themselves, which we have lost a way to understand and engage with. And I want to recover that connection, right? Which we presumably, presumably could have had more easily had we been there with a the time machine, but we don't. So all the uh, for myself, all the craft of historiography um, can be deployed to that and learn from the past. Now, I'm not saying that that's the only thing we do with it, but that, that, that looms quite large in, in my thinking about like, why am I doing history? What's the point of something like history of science? Right? And if the past really were thus launching past to the present, then history is not really that useful. <laughs> right. But I don't think it has been. And I think almost always by looking at the past of science, I can learn something, which is broadly speaking scientific. Right. So in other words, I, I, I'm not really interested in using history as data points for philosophical theory. Right. Yeah. But how the history and philosophy relate very closely to me is in struggling to understand the past, I often find myself needing new and revised philosophical conceptions. So it's a heuristic role that history has for me for philosophy. In order to understand this alien way of living and thinking and understanding, I need to change my notions about what knowledge is and what nature is like, what scientific methods are. Sorry, that was a rambling answer. No, thank you. So I'm aware of the time. It's past five o'clock. I do have several other people on my list, but I'm wondering if we can invite them to come and approach you. Yeah, um, and uh, I will be here all tomorrow as well if you want catch me at any time. All right. Thank you so much. Thank <laughs> you.